thank you very much, Joe. And I think we can start a discussion. Uh, so, any questions? Okay. <laughs> Um, my question goes to James Krapfel. Um, you mentioned those surveys uh, from November and December 1989, uh, which said that majority of Czech and Slovaks were for keeping socialism or uh, something like that. Uh, my question is, um, uh, what? How many people were included in, in these surveys? What were the questions? Or to put it simple, um, as I remember the atmosphere of that time, I, I, would, to put it, uh, I would not say majority of Czech and Slovaks uh, were for continuing uh, socialism. Maybe if, if the answers were in that direction, maybe it was because uh, people were still afraid in the November and December weeks to, to express their opinion um, openly uh, as they were accustomed in the communism, or I don't know. Uh, but if the people uh, would support socialism, they would rather vote uh, for uh, Alexander Dubček or Chesmir Cisar, who was another candidate for the president of 1968 people. Um, yeah, if you can evolve on, on that, uh, on, or how simply, uh, how big the, if you know, uh, how big the community of people which were asked in those surveys was. And a second question, I don't, uh, you mentioned the leaflets which were portraying Havel as someone who, is, who was rich but uh, is not um, is not a capitalist or something, uh, the, where the, I don't remember these leaflets. But were those leaflets somewhere in Slovakia or you know uh, uh, <laughs> where does they come from? I, I remember the the posters of Václav Havel uh, to, to the castle uh, or with uh, the actor Landowski, but do not remember th those mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, and maybe I will add something to the first uh, part of your question because, uh, first of all, I would like to ask you, uh, James, uh, because you spoke about a victory of 68 over 89, and uh, you argued that there, like, there was some emancipatory potential. So you believe in emancipatory potential of Prague Spring of 1968. You were referring to the 89. I was, I was referring to 89. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, uh, if, you, if you say, okay, th there was a victory uh, of 68 over 89, you argued that the 68 somehow uh, succeeded in 1989. Do, do, I mean, do uh, I mean? Do you understand how? Uh, because you argued that there were references to uh, socialism with a human face to Prague Spring, and my question would be like, uh, where is the emancipatory potential? Uh, if I actually, if I understood uh, your paper correctly or your argument correctly, when uh, during 1960s and during Prague Spring you have this very specific intellectual culture based on Marxist humanism and the whole like socialism with human face and uh, dialogue uh, of Marxism with non-Marxist political streams and uh, uh, in, I don't know like very specific aesthetics like new wave and theaters and so on. But uh, intellectually in 1989 uh, nothing was there what would uh, became a bearer of socialist ideas, like a, you know, like a proper philosophy that would uh, be, I mean, that could somehow bear the emancipatory potential. Of course, I don't want to argue that uh, I like I, the social change must be uh, based purely on ideas, but still, that this is my main question. I mean, how could 1989 uh, have emancipatory uh, potential without emancip like some philosophical uh, emancipatory ideas, because you argued only by people's rhetoric, but some kind of philosophical 
let's say, um, conceptualization of what socialism is was completely missing. Thank you. Uh, can I just add something to this question because it's very important? Uh, you were talking about those surveys, yeah? Similar surveys were conducted in Poland. Uh, and also, I don't remember the data at the moment, also they, have shown, they had shown that there was no support for the restoration of capitalism, yeah? And uh, the second point, was, and this is my question, uh, was that after the overthrowing the bureaucratic regime, yeah? There was a moment, and it is under research how long it lasted, a moment of explosion of cooperatives and that feeling I was talking about, we, are, we have kicked out the bureaucracy and now we take, hand, take things into our hands. Yeah? And uh, of course it was very easy uh, as a strange show to, uh, to uh, switch with this narrative into the uh, liberal discourse. Yeah? How was it? Uh, how was it in uh, in Czechoslovakia? And another question. Uh, uh, okay, so that's it. That's, that's just just to that. I think it's enough, maybe for for you. For uh, some question for Joe. Well, yeah, many questions. Okay, one. Take the next one. Okay, you can take the ne next one. And one more remark. I'm very sorry, but I have to leave like soon. So maybe someone could sit here instead of me and <laughs> <laughs> pretending being me. And maybe yeah, now in let's say five, ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so please, James. Okay. So um, I don't need to show those opinion surveys. I show them simply because it's easy to show them in a graph on a slide, it's much more difficult to sit here and make you all read 10,000 documents. Um, to my knowledge, only two other people have read all of these archival, or a majority of these archival documents, or rather a large number. Uh, the archivist of the Public Against Violence Archive in Bratislava, and the archivist of the Civic Forum Archive in Prague. Um, and they both agreed with me upon reading a majority of these documents that yes, um, <laughs> there is actually no support expressed in these documents for dismantling socialism, but on the contrary, for preserving it. Um, the majority of these documents are also from outside of Prague. The only people I see at the grassroots level calling for a market economy in 1989 are people in Prague. Um, and that might make some sense because it's the capital, it's it more open to the rest of the world. Um, but it, it's not there outside of Prague initially. It, and I was, as I was saying, this changes, and I think it changes very easily because the rhetoric of support for socialism was there partly because it was automatic and it was like something they were accustomed to and it, there was really no alternative as yet on the horizon. Um, but the ease with which it's displaced shows that it was not that deeply felt. Um, as I was trying to argue, socialism was a, a relatively empty signifier for this ideal society, which people did have a, a very strong feeling for on the squares of 1989. And so when something else could come and claim to represent this ideal society, then they sw could easily switch to that. And that's why I emphasize that those who were selling the market economy tried, they argued not that this would be a more efficient economy, but that this will bring about a more moral society. That's where they had to argue. Um, so the, the opinion poll w was done by sociologists. It was a professional opinion poll with, I, I assume they, that they got the, the sample they need. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but the documentary evidence certainly supports it. Um, so with regard to the emancipatory potential of 68 and 89, I see the emancipatory potential of both years, and this is me speaking just as me rather than as a scholar, but based on everything I see, I see the emancipatory potential in the critiques of violence that were articulated in both years. Um, 1968 worldwide 
was, can arguably be discussed in terms of critiques of violence that were articulated in various milieu based on local circumstances. Um, but I would argue that the critique that developed in Czechoslovakia and more broadly in East Central Europe after 1968 was in crucial respects more profound than that which developed elsewhere. And you can see this beginning immediately after the invasion. Before the invasion, public discourse was centered around the question of how do we envision a democratic socialism? After the invasion, there's a recognition that we can't even discuss that question unless we've got guarantees that what we decide is actually going to be implemented. If we have guarantees of rule of law and human rights, which is a, a term that comes into existence or comes into frequency already in 1968. Um, and the invasion, of course, prompts people to criticize violence even more systematically than they had done previously. And they had done it previously, too. But it breaks out of the Marxist critique of violence. And of course, Marxism likewise starts out as a critique of violence. But I would use the word suffer to say that Marxism suffers from its materialist reductionism. The insight of Central Europeans after 1968 was to break out of that reductionism and see metaphysical roots of violence that needed to be addressed as well. And this is where Jan Patochka comes in very strongly with the solidarity of the shaken. And if there was one philosophical idea that did circulate at the grassroots level in 1989, it was the solidarity of the shaken, which was even encapsulated in the Slovak anthem of the year. Ivan Hoffman's song, We Promised Each Other Love, illustrates the idea of the solidarity of the shaken. But this is a phrase that comes up in many of the grassroots documents as well. And it's something people could relate to because their coming out onto the squares was really done in solidarity with the victims of violence on Narodi Chita. So where I think we need to be going is to build on this insight that the problem is violence per se in all its forms. And this is one of the things we can get from 1989 because it did articulate a, criti a very systematic critique of violence that was not just physical or just economic, but could also be psychological, environmental, and take many other forms. And this is where I would see something to be, to take as inspiration for thinking about the future. So maybe it, um, two more questions. Já bych se chtěl zeptat pana Jamesa, jestli v západních nebo jiných zahraničních zemích, když hovoříte o Československu, v roce 68 dostáváte takovou jednoduchou dichotomickou otázku a bylo to za socialismus, anebo to bylo za kapitalismus. Já bych si troufl nabídnout jednu odpověď podle svých zkušeností i podle toho, co vyplývalo z vašich průzkumů, že lidé prostě neměli nebo neměli jsme jasno, co je to socialismus, neměli jsme jasno, co je to kapitalismus, ale v první řadě jsme měli jasno v tom, že chceme překonat ten konflikt mezi nimi. Ten mezinárodní kontext, který předcházel tomu období, to bylo obrovské zvýšení mezinárodního napětí v první polovině 80. let, reálné očekávání jaderné války, takový velice neurotizující střed ideologický vlna propagandistická proti, proti Spojeným státům a celému západu. Tady Ronald Reagan zase si dělal legraci, že za pár minut začne bombardování Světského svazu. A v tuhle chvíli my jsme prostě chtěli uvěřit tomu, že konflikt mezi socialismem a kapitalismem je překonaný, že patří někam do 19. století a teď Teď prostě je tady něco nového, moderního, sociálně tržní hospodářství, řekněme. 
A, e, čili my jsme dokonce nechtěli ani nějakou třetí cestu, my jsme prostě chtěli popřít vůbec to, že je potřeba si vybírat mezi socialismem a kapitalismem, e, jestli byste souhlasil s takovýmhle výkladem, se kterým souvisí třeba i to, že hlavní prout, který vycházel třeba, nebo se reprezentoval v občanském hnutí, tvrdil, že není levicový, není pravicový, dokonce ani, že není středový, prostě, že tyhle kategorie jsou dávno překonané. A pak bych měl ještě jednu otázku, která bude asi na oba, která je taková trošku sugestivní, propagandistická a primitivní. Souhlasili byste s názorem, že relativně nejlepším reprezentantem myšlenek roku 89 je sociálně demokratický prout, že by sociální demokracie se k tomu měla přihlásit, postavit na tom svoji identitu, představit takhle svoji roli ve společnosti, že ona představuje nejlépe ze všech odkaz roku 89. So that was the one more towards me. And Uh, that was towards both of us, um, that whether social democracy is maybe the most uh, appropriate or authentic uh, representative of 1989 and the thought of 1989. Um, which also maybe brings me back to the earlier question that was posed to James that I wanted to say something about. Um, <coughs> whether so social, I, I think, Saying social democracy, giving a kind of monopoly of over 1989 to social democracy would be a bit complicated. Sorry, forgot about this. Um, would be a bit complicated since, uh, though I would say social democrats within the framework of 1989 represented primarily those people who came out of something like reform communism, even though structurally they would form a party that was outside of the Communist Party framework. Um, and reform communism was, was, went back towards looking at uh, much more towards the legacy of 1968. So insofar as 1989 was 68, not upside down, but like a continuation of 68, then I think social democracy in some ways was, was an appropriate uh, representative or, uh, of, or say uh, vehicle for the ideas. But I also think that there were other ideas that were developed in and leading up to 1989, uh, other philosophical approaches that I, I think I would just like to add a couple of things to, to what James said, uh, which is, I mean, this brings us to the level of speculation of counter historical um, speculation, which some historians uh, find very problematic, but I, th I think uh, there's also a certain moral imperative if we want to, to see whether this path's not taken could actually function critically for the current moment. So some of the paths that were articulated at certain moments leading up to 1989 uh, with, I think, compelling philosophical basis for something like a renewed or democratic, democratized socialism um, were, one would be, The, the one or the couple that James pointed to, the socialism um, that understands the problem of violence as, as an existential problem. And Havel spoke about an existential revolution um, and that takes, takes that as a new impulse for reforming socialism. And Havel himself um, not only said that he's not against socialism, but, but he also although he was in, insistent that he doesn't want to prescribe any particular form, after he was pushed on the issue, there's this um, interesting moment in the long book-length interview with him that's called in English, Disturbing the Peace, uh, where the, the interviewer asks him, so what do you imagine about the new society? And he says, oh, I, it, it's not for me to tell you what the new society should look like. And I think five different times that The interviewer insists, no, no, what do you really imagine? And finally, Havel says, well, I imagine a variety of different forms, uh, but the most important of them 
would be uh, the forms of some kind of collective uh, operation of, of uh, economic issues, which is the great idea of socialism that has always that has, that has been at socialism since the beginning. So this idea of self-management as, as an ethical imperative also comes back in 1989 as something that's not only a reproduction of 68, but a, a new impulse. Um, we can look also, like Karel Kosik, having shifted from his thought of the 1960s, is much, uh, emphasizes the metaphysical dimension of, of revolution and, and politics in after 1989. Um, or the, there's the underground and people like Egon Bondi who emphasize this kind of continual revolt and renewal. That these are all ideas that I think that were articulated and could have been taken further and maybe still can be, but, uh, but were pushed out of the mainstream after 1989. I would not um, link any one particular party with the legacy of 1989, although I would note that besides Civic Forum and Public Against Violence, the most popular actual party in early 1990 was the Green Party. Um, and certainly the Green Movement does articulate <laughs> critiques of violence that transcend narrow reductionism. But I would argue that any politician or political stream that stands for Slushnost, another key concept of 1989, decency, um, is loyal to the legacy of 1989. Because the revolution was about pluralism, the end of rule by one party, democracy, which requires plural, pluralism of opinions as well as pluralism of power. And there are certain things, I mean, one of the supporters of the Civic Democratic Party in, I think it was 1991, described conservatism as adherence to that which lasts. And in that sense, and also as a historian, I, I'm somewhat conservative. There are things that over centuries have been proven to be true, and one of them is that the only thing that can stop power is power. And democracy, therefore, can function only if people are able to have the tools of power themselves to defend themselves from power. And this is something we see happening in 1989, particularly with the student movement to fan out and educate people about their program and to teach workers how to go on strike, how to organize these movements. The students, by educating society, gave society the tools to exert power as its own force, to, get, to allow individuals to exert power. And if there has been one fundamentally disappointing trend since the early 1990s, it has been the suffering of education. Because without education, it's difficult for people to see when they're being manipulated. And so they lack the power to defend themselves against power. Um, with regard to the question of whether 68 was for capitalism or socialism, um, Ludwig Watzulik describes going to a public meeting in Semily in the late spring or early summer of 1968, and how the question came up at that meeting about whether the future direction of Czechoslovakia should be socialist or capitalist. And the student who was speaking said, well, I don't really feel strongly about the question, but I'd vote for socialism because that's what we have and it's easier not to have to shift everything. So fundamentally, I question the degree to which at any time people have really known what socialism or capitalism is. I mean, there have been interpretations, but these are abstract concepts that are difficult to find agreement upon. Um, and I myself, if pressed, would find it difficult to give a definition that I could say to be the objective truth. I, I, and therefore, I prefer to think in terms of concrete relationships and whether violence is a part of them or not. Okay, um, I think we're running out of time.